my, <clears throat> my theme is the future of legal education. My thesis is that a revolution in legal education is both possible and needed. The essential content of this revolution is that the law schools should study and teach law. And they should equip people to do the many different things that can be done with law. Now this thesis may at first seem to be an innocuous platitude. My claim is that in the present context, it is a revolutionary proposition that requires a radical reorientation of what the law schools do. For this project to advance, the decisive question is whether the international corporate bar will be allowed to shape the future of legal education. I advance in four steps. In the first step, I make three observations about law and legal education that provide points of departure. In the second step, I address the direction. In the third step, I speak about the enemy. And in the fourth step, I make a remark about the opportunity. The points of departure. My first observation is about the world. The world today is bent under a dictatorship of no alternatives. There is now a very restricted repertory throughout the world of living institutional options for the organization of different areas of social life. These options exist in the form of law. This restricted repertory is the fate of the contemporary society. We cannot go forward in the realization of our ideals and of our interests without renovating this repertory of institutional arrangements. To renovate it, we need to enlist the materials that exist as law. This brings me then to my second observation, which is about law. <coughs> law is, as Hegel remarked, the institutionalized form of the life of the people. Our ideals and interests are always nailed to the cross of the institutions and practices that represent them in fact. The site of this crucifixion is the law. It is through our legal thinking our reimagination of law, our development of law, that we conduct the vital dialectic between our understanding of our ideals and our interests and our commitment to the institutions and practices of society. My third observation is about legal education. And more specifically, it is about the relation, or rather, the lack of relation, between who is in the law schools and what the law schools do. In the United States, legal education is now intellectually broader in the elite law schools than it is almost anywhere else in the world. Nevertheless, the composition of the law schools, of their students, 
is on the whole very narrow. The great majority of the students in the leading American law schools will practice law in the narrowest sense as members of corporate law firms or of the legal departments of large corporations. There is very little relation between what these American law schools teach and what this leading part of the legal profession narrowly understood does. What is the contribution of the law schools to the activities of this elite legal profession? In the first place, it is to train people in an argumentative apparatus, in a conventional style of discourse, which then serves as the canon in this legal culture. And in the second place, it is to select people, to anoint them as the cleverest so that they can later perform these functions. <coughs> uh, thus, the selection for legal discourse in the law schools performs a function that is <coughs> analogous to mathematics for the study of economics. Mathematics being, in economics, a proxy for cleverness. And as the performance of this function in economics cannot be achieved without the trivialization of mathematics, so too the performance of the analogous function in law cannot be fulfilled without the debasement of legal thought. The people selected by this mechanism are, on the whole, prepared to become eunuchs. The price of their preferment is their castration. Sometimes, the intended victims escape the knife. In a large part of the rest of the world, however, the vast majority of students who go to the law schools have no intention of entering the legal profession narrowly understood, and they do not enter it. They go to law school in order to learn what the deal is in their societies and to master the official discourse in which to elaborate the deal. They go to law school to join the national elite, the state elite in their societies. That is why they go to law school, but that is not what they get in law school. On the whole, what they get in law school is a desiccated doctrinal scholasticism that is neither theoretical nor practical. So where the scope of legal education is relatively broad, the composition of the law schools is narrow. And where the composition is broad, the scope is narrow. There is no relation almost no relation between what goes on in law schools around the world and the actual functions that they perform in their societies. And from this mismatch, I infer a transformative opportunity. There is no strong functional determination. Let us give all of these people who go to law school to learn what the deal is in their societies and how to master the deal, how to elaborate it. Let us give them what they want. The essence of my program for the redirection of legal education is to exploit the comparative advantage of law as the site 
where our interests and ideals meet our institutions and practices. And to take advantage of the mismatch between the composition of the law schools and the content of what they do to overthrow the dictatorship of no alternatives in the world. From the inside out and from the bottom up, by enlisting in the service of the transformative imagination, the anomalies, the contradictions, the variations that exist as law. I now advance to the second part of my remarks, the translation of this agenda into a program of reform. And uh, here, I present this program solely from the standpoint of its curricular implications. Uh, imagine a form of legal education organized on the basis of four curriculums. The first curriculum is a global law curriculum. The object of comparative law or global law today is to map the very limited repertory of alternative legal and institutional setups for the organization of different areas of social life that are available in the world today. It makes no sense, either theoretical or practical, to study the detailed legal rules of all the legal systems that exist in the world. What does make sense is to master the key. And the key is the logic of these alternative institutional setups described in detail as law. Once we master this institutional repertory, we become able to reimagine it gradually in small cumulative steps by analogical extension and recombination. The second curriculum is the national law curriculum. And the national law curriculum should properly be seen as the projection, the microscopic projection of the intellectual agenda of the global law curriculum onto the national legal system to present national law without the pretense of representing it as an idealized system, to present it realistically. In all of its contradictions and anomalies and variations and deviations, for reasons that are both theoretical and practical. The third curriculum is the professionalization curriculum to equip people with the instruments to do things with law. Now, what we ordinarily think of as the legal profession in the narrow sense is only a small fragment of the range of activities that do things with law. To teach people uh, research, argument, drafting, and negotiation in at least three sets of contexts. One context is the most traditional context of the representation of interest in an adjudicative or quasi-adjudicative setting. That's what we ordinarily think of as the legal profession. The second setting is the setting of the design of transactions. 
which is, after all, most of the actual activity of the elite bar today anywhere in the world. Without any special relation to the adjudicative setting. And the third context, which will become increasingly important over time, is the design or redesign of institutions in the course of the activity of representing and reinterpreting interests of particular groups and organizations in civil society. Law in the future will cease to be simply the law that is made by the state and imposed top down, and will become increasingly law that is created by civil society itself from the bottom up. There is therefore no bright line contrast between the design of transactions and the design of institutions. The professionalization curriculum is not simply a practical concession. It is a device of liberation because it makes the students less dependent upon organizations like the corporate law firms to learn how to do things with law. The fourth curriculum is the curriculum of the non-legal disciplines that should and can inform both our understanding of law and our practice of law. Now, we all know that the distinctive content of law has increasingly been hollowed out, and that contemporary legal thought increasingly attempts to import the content from everywhere else, from all the other disciplines. And the problem is that we do need an economics and a political science and a sociology and a political philosophy, but not the economics, the political science, the sociology, and the political philosophy that exist rather the ones that don't exist. The trouble with the ones that do exist, that occupy the commanding heights in the academic world, is that they are bereft of any way of understanding the structure of society expressed in law. They have no structural imagination, no insight into structural discontinuity and structural alternatives. And therefore, the task of this fourth curriculum is to serve as a surrogate for the disciplines that don't exist, to use the space of the law school as a terrain of contestation, of subversion, of transformation of the methodological orthodoxies in the established social disciplines. Law is, by its very nature, a provocation to such a redirection of our ideas about society and its structure. I now come to the third part of my remarks. Who or what is the enemy? Now, the most important enemy is the dominant canonical style of legal thought today. The rationalizing representation of law in the vocabulary of impersonal policy and principle. This is the style of legal discourse that presents itself as the wave of the future, as the providential successor to the doctrinal conceptualism and formalism of the 19th century. The paradigm of this legal culture 
established above all in the leading centers of legal culture in the West, especially the United States and Germany, is the coexistence of this discourse of rationalizing representation of law as an idealized system in the vocabulary of policy and principle with the criticism of this discourse in the name of radical indeterminacy or deconstruction. The radical indeterminacy idea is an intellectual and political calamity. As intellectually empty as it is politically sterile. And it suits perfectly the defenders of the dominant style of legal discourse who were able to cast themselves as the reasonable centrists between the two extremes of doctrinal conceptualism on one side and irresponsible reduction of law to politics on the other side. The defenders of this established legal culture now want to propagate it throughout the world. And my thesis is that we should resist it. We should overthrow it. And we should replace it. We should replace it by a view of law that recognizes law as it really is full of contradiction, anomaly, and deviation, and therefore, as well, full of transformative opportunity. The bare bones of the justification for this view is provided first by a conception of the consequences of this style of discourse, and second, by a view of its real significance in its historical context. It is a mystification of law. It is a usurpation of democratic power by the jurists who, on the pretext of interpreting and improving the law, or putting the best face on it, in fact, want to hijack the power of the democracy. And above all, it is an attempt to insulate the established institutional arrangements against challenge and change, to make the best of the existing situation. All of this becomes clearer when we understand this style of discourse in its historical context. Consider three moments in its history. The first is the moment of the refoundation, the social democratic settlement called the New Deal in the United States of the mid 20th century. With its characteristic abandonment of the attempt to redesign the structure of power and of production in exchange for the granting of more power to regulate and to redistribute to the state. The second moment is the moment of normalization. This project is then generalized as a system of legal categories. The substantive content of this normalization is the effort to superimpose a new body of public law, regulatory and redistributive, on the largely untransformed pre-existing body of private law. And the methodological characteristic of this moment of normalization <coughs> is the development of a purposive policy-oriented and principle-based style of legal discourse, not as a substitute of the doctrinal formalism of the 19th century, but as a looser, less heroic version of the same thing. And now comes the third moment, the moment that we are in, the moment of darkening. 
the settlement of the mid-20th century recedes. It becomes a fading light. It begins to be contested. It fails to speak to the fighting issues of today. In this moment of darkening, the jurists only half believe in the presuppositions of this dominant style of discourse. But they regard it as a convenient myth in the defense of their power and in the promotion of the social interests that they advocate. And legal culture becomes increasingly theorized because theory occupies the vacuum left by the retreat of the institutional settlement. And what goes on in the classroom? Three things simultaneously. First, the desperate attempt to revive and reiterate the canonical style of legal discourse. Second, the effort to make up for our disbelief by importing models from all the other social disciplines. The social disciplines that lack a vision of structure. And thus the, the law schools, especially the American law schools, begin to be filled up with second-rate economists and political scientists and philosophers, tightening the, the noose of a spiritual servitude. <laughs> and third, the reduction of discourse about law to simply a pretext to establish a conversation within a would-be elite about the problems of the society. And what shapes this conversation? Nothing, except everyone's desire to remain an insider. It is the discourse of the newspapers only one notch up. This is not the wave of the future. This is uh, obscurantism, intellectual illusion, and political enslavement. The SJDs should not work as the emissaries of this paradigm and of its diffusion throughout the world. They should be its relentless antagonists to subvert it and to replace it in their countries. And in this way, to contribute to the overthrow of the dictatorship of no alternatives in the world. Now, there are two other enemies to which I shall refer more briefly. The second enemy is the intellectual background today. Across the whole field of social and historical studies, what we see prevailing are rationalizing, humanizing, and escapist tendencies. In the hard social sciences, economics first among them, the rationalization of the existent. Right-wing Hegelianism disguised as science. In the normative discipline, such as political philosophy, the pseudo-philosophical gloss on the ameliorative practices of mid-20th century social democracy. Philosophy in the service of compensatory redistribution through tax and transfer. And in the service of the idealization of law in the vocabulary of policy and principle. And in the humanities, subjectivist adventurism, disconnected from the reimagination and remaking of society. The votaries of these three tendencies, the rationalizing, the humanizing, and the escapists, pretend to be antagonists when they are, in fact, allies in the disarmament of the transformative imagination. The third enemy 
are the interests of the status groups of the jurists and professionals who have a stake or think they have a stake in the worldwide diffusion of this form of discourse. Now first, the, the academic jurists and the legal quasi-politicians who want to circumvent political politics through judicial politics. Their politics is the humanization of the inevitable. Their morality is the ethic of Pontius Pilate. Their campaigns begin and end in hand washing. Their whole object is to be blameless. And then the future legal professionals, especially the candidates for entry into the international corporate bar, intimately disbelieve and deride this canonical legal discourse. But they regard its reign as convenient because it generates a fog of cultural prestige and political rectitude behind which they can devote themselves sadly to the craven pursuit of their dispirited money making. <laughs> the antidote to this third influence is not to convert them or persuade them. They cannot be converted or persuaded. Their hearts are hardened and their minds are closed. The antidote is to dilute their presence in the law schools. By attracting to the law schools all the other constituencies who are or might be interested in doing things with law under the aegis of the renovated program that I defended. And in this way, they would come to be seen as the lobby, as the special interests that they are, rather than as having any natural purchase on the direction of legal education. The opportunity. The greatest opportunity is the struggle today under the dictatorship of no alternatives to form strong national projects in the world. By strong national projects, I mean projects that require a strong state able to mobilize the physical, economic, and human resources of the nation to reject the formula of imposed institutional convergence and to experiment with the institutions and practices for the sake of economic inclusion and educational empowerment. That activity requires the mobilization of the conceptual and practical resources of law, made patent by the transformed program of legal education that I earlier outlined and defended. Now this program confronts such a formidable array of obstacles that there is no hope it could advance unless it receives the surprising assistance of an indispensable ally. The visionary impulse. Therefore, let the prophetic voice within each of us speak its speech is dangerous. Its silence 
it's fatal. Thank you, Professor Unger, for such a powerful and empowering speech. I would like to invite the, the audience to comment, ask questions. Please. Uh, my name is Tom Chow. Uh, I am a here. Uh, so you know, apparently I mean, this is a very powerful speech, and I'm very sympathetic to the project itself. And I do agree that over the time, uh, I think one of the great challenges facing the scholars, not especially legal scholars, is the so-called you know, uh, in poverty of imagination. So you talk about the institutional imagination, which I think really kind of hits uh, the nail on the head you know, uh, in that sense. So I agree with you on that. And so when you when you criticize the whole legal scholarship, you know, try to uh, import it from different you know, uh, disciplines, <laughs> but then the problem with all these disciplines just as you pointed out, you know, I mean, they lack the structural uh, critique, and they also do not have visions as well. So in other words, they have the same kind of a, a fatal, uh, uh, you know, sickness, uh, uh, which probably kind of a, you know, crisis in their social science field as well. So by importing that and kind of pretending to enrich the legal scholarship, but at the end of the day, we never, nevertheless, you know, never kind of uh, be able to walk out of these Iron room, but then I guess my challenge kind of would be, okay, so tell me what's the mystery of legal scholars? In other words, what, what's the mystery here which kind of enables scholars to be able to walk out of this iron room uh, or you know, prison of lack of imagination? In other words, uh, why should I trust that the lawyers are able to do that? In other words, what are you know, possible uh, advantage, comparable demand, advantage the lawyers <coughs> have, or maybe like legal academic have, you know, has uh, to be able to realize the vision you presented to us in a very kind of passionate way? So, <coughs> I do not claim that legal thought is the only terrain in which this transformation of our understanding of society can take place. But it is a terrain that has advantages intrinsic to law. So uh, first let me say something particular or conjunctural about the situation in the United States. And then I want to say something more general about the nature of legal thought. <laughs> so now in the United States, Law is the only social discipline that is not under the control of a methodological orthodoxy. And this is entirely surprising, because in the United States, it is the discipline that is closest to power. And what happened is that the disintegration of the methodological consensus in the 1970s was never followed by the reestablishment of a new methodological hegemony. So people say, well, critical legal studies withered. Of course, it was never designed to be permanent. But its most important legacy is this lasting methodological pluralism. Now, I hope that a similar situation will be established throughout the world. And that law in many countries in the world will be the discipline that is least under the control of a methodological orthodoxy. <coughs> so that is the first reason why law is a favorite terrain. But there's a second reason. The second reason has to do with the universal history of legal thought. Uh, there are three great themes in the history of legal thought worldwide. I'm not thinking just of the civil law and common law traditions. I'm thinking of the world as a whole. So the first theme is the idea of law as an imminent moral order, revealed 
by doctrine. The doctrinal quest for the revelation of this structure. Law as an intelligible and defensible plan of social life. The second idea in the universal history of law <coughs> is the idea of law as the will of the sovereign, law made by whoever has power. And this law as the will of the sovereign acquires a greater legitimacy or authority when the sovereign is democratic. But both of these ideas are not only contradictory with each other, they're also radically incomplete. They only work by reliance on a third idea, which is the real structure of society. <coughs> Unexplained, unjustified, and to a considerable extent even unseen. The contradictions internal to the universal history of law require us to develop a vision of the structure. And in the final instance, these contradictions can only be superseded in practice, not in theory, by the project of the self-construction of society through new forms of economic and political life. For those reasons, uh, the vocation of reimagining the structure has a special immediacy and power in law. Amiru? Well, thank you. My name, is, <coughs> my name is Aminu SJD Kadir and I think I'm one of the agents for this project. Uh, we, we know the enemies who are our allies. That is the first question for the uh, execution of this project. You have argued in many occasions that uh, the current system has been designed to sustain itself to resist any attempt for rebellion because every change depends on crisis. What is the crisis? What is the trigger for the execution of this project? So, uh, <clears throat> part of the task is to develop institutions that diminish the dependence of change on crisis. Uh, the task of the imagination is to do the work of crisis without crisis. Uh, my hope is that there is <coughs> another circumstance that can partly replace the contribution of a worldwide crisis. And the other circumstance is the desire among major countries in the world, especially the large emerging society, uh, to develop their own path, their own form of life, in conflict with the Metternichian project that the great powers have attempted to impose on humanity since the end of the Second World War. So what we find in many countries around the world is that in the recent historical period, the chief instruments of so-called neoliberalism or of the Washington consensus were the economists. Now, it doesn't have to be this way. And there has to be, and I believe there will be, a struggle within economics to turn economics into the discipline of institutional imagination than it should be. Uh, but today, uh, it is the jurists who are most plausibly the agents for the construction, for the intellectual formulation of these strong national projects, in contradiction to this subservient role of the economists. <coughs> and so, this alliance between the interest in the formation of strong national projects and the interest of the jurists in performing this role uh, creates a promise. It is one of the sources of hope for the transformation of this circumstance. But the premise 
for our success in seizing this opportunity, I insist, is that we reject. We reject what is supposed to be the wave of the future. This post-formalist legal culture now established in the United States and in Germany and in other places that begins to be propagated throughout the world. The premise is that we say that's not the wave of the future. That is a regression. And that we refuse to believe that indeterminacy or deconstruction is an alternative to that canonical legal culture. It is not. It is an implicit ally. It is not a serious enemy. So this is the transformation that is required. And it could be expressed practically in the reshaping of legal education. In the back, Richard. Hi, I'm Richard Lee, I'm the researcher at Harvard Law School. What implications does this have for uh, the, a, ne a necessary threshold uh, shift in subjectivity? We've explored the, the concept of emancipation, possible new institutions, and, and reformulations of collectives. Does this imply that there is some form of transformation of self towards the enabling of such collectives? <coughs> You mean of people in general or of the jurists? I'm just wondering, if this is an ambitious plan that I identify with. Yes. It has to be done by individuals. Yes. And I'm wondering whether your, uh, your, in, your intuitions indicate whether there are threshold levels that we must download upon ourselves in order to achieve yes. the, the enabling of such yes. collectives. Yes. So there is, a, there is a heroic element in any large transformative project. And there is this problem in the history of social theory that the heroic element has often depended upon illusion. So take the example of Marxism. There is a kind of historical theology, a, a belief in a predetermined historical sequence. History is on our side. And the almost deliberate illusion is used in order to help arouse the heroic will. But it is costly to make the will depend upon illusion. And what I want is a transformative will that depends on no illusion. So <coughs> we have to get out of this binary structure in which there are two forms of life. There is the routinized form of ordinary life, our sleepwalking, in which we only make moves within a, a framework of assumptions and arrangements that we take for granted. And then there are the, the ecstatic moments, the exceptional moments, in which under the provocation of crisis, we are drawn out of the long littleness of life into a, into a larger experience. <clears throat> now, life is the supreme good. Life in the present. And all of the dominant ideas in our civilization are dominant projects of spiritual and political liberation have this characteristic that they place the supreme good in the future, whether it is the historical future or the providential future. And therefore, they create the danger of our estrangement from the present. But the only good that we have for sure is life right now. So my fundamental answer to your question is that what we should most desire is that our intensity of life right now increase, cumulatively, in steps. Uh, and that this ecstatic experience of challenging and changing the framework become more and more part of the routine of an ordinary existence. Then we will become more human because we have become more godlike. 
Да. You mean the program, the program for law? Your program for the law school. Well, I, I, I can't really do that because, and I'll tell you why, because uh, uh, this vision has implications for the, for the redirection of legal analysis. Uh, and more broadly, for the redirection of social thought. But I made a deliberate choice in this argument here, to focus only on the fragment, which are the curricular implications, <laughs> because they're the most tangible, and because they lend themselves to treatment in a, in a narrow compass. But it should be clear that this, this project is only the edge, the apparent edge of a much larger program. Now, I think it's very important that people think that they could converge to a program of reform of legal education like this one without subscribing to the, to the broader intellectual agenda or the program for the transformation of society that I want to defend. I, I wasn't relating to the transformation of society. I was uh, relating to other areas of a possible program for the law school. So for, for example, teacher-student relations, uh, funding through philanthropy or through tuition, yeah. uh, admitting, admittance policy, uh, clinical education, these, these issues. I think all of that is less important than the fundamental method of education. So I think my most relevant response to you is to say that these curricular changes should be uh, enveloped in a larger idea of, of what education should look like in general, about anything. And education should uh, be based on the premise that the fundamental role of a school in a democracy, whether it is an elementary school or a law school or a philosophy department, the fundamental role of a school is to be the voice of the future. The task of the school is to recognize in every student a tongue-tied prophet. The school should not be the instrument of the state, and it should not be the instrument of the family. And on that basis, we want a form of education that has four fundamental attributes. The first attribute is that it gives the highest priority to our analytic and synthetic capabilities, to our capabilities to decompose and recombine and renovate ideas. It is the liberation of the mind. The mind has two sides. On one side, the mind is like a machine, modular and formulaic. But on the other side, the mind is an anti-machine. It is not modular. It is not formulaic. It enjoys a power of recursive infinity of combining everything with everything else. And it advances by transgressing its own presuppositions. That is the mind as imagination. So the first attribute of education is that it should help the second side of the mind prevail over the first. The second attribute of education is that, therefore, in the pursuit of this ideal, it should repudiate any conception of uh, encyclopedic inclusion. It should use information selectively as a device of analytic capability. Depth is more important than scope. The third attribute of education is that it should privilege cooperation in teaching and learning over the combination of individualism and authoritarianism that generally characterizes the classroom. <laughs> and the fourth attribute of education to fulfill this role is that it should be dialectical. Every subject 
should be taught from at least two contrasting points of view. Every subject should be taught at least twice. Uh, and this uh, contrast is the only reliable way in which to liberate the mind. We have time for one more question, please. Yes. Fernando Herrero in the, in the humanities. Uh, if you oppose post-formalism, if you oppose indeterminacy, what should we understand when you invoke structure or form? I'm not sure I understand the question, but let me say this. First of all, why I, why I oppose indeterminacy. Indeterminacy is not for real in, in, in legal thought. So the idea that the interpreter can make the law mean whatever he wants it to mean is a kind of wishful thinking. So what it says in effect is it doesn't matter who wins or loses in politics. Because once the law falls into our hands, we can make it mean whatever we want it to mean. Now, indeterminacy became popular in the, uh, in the American Academy. Because in the United States, the legal radicals were always politically marginalized. Uh, and rather than confronting this marginalization and attempting to overcome it, they gave in to the temptation of this wishful thinking. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an intellectual and politi political desert. It leads nowhere. Uh, now, uh, the imagination of structure. I can only speak in a minute about this. The central insight of classical social theory was that society is made and imagined. The structures of society are artifacts. They are our creations. And as Vico remarked, because we made them, we can understand them. So there is a, underneath the surface, a series of formative arrangements and assumptions. And the transformation of these structures is the real subject of political and intellectual change. <laughs> the trouble is that in classical social theory, this revolutionary insight was burdened by the incubus of a series of fatalistic assumptions. That there's a closed list of systems of social life in history. That each of these systems is indivisible. And that they follow each other in a predetermined sequence under the pressure of inexorable laws of transformation. All of this is false. And what happened is that contemporary social science, in rejecting these assumptions of historical fatalism, also rejected the original revolutionary insight and produced a vision of social life as being naturalized, as being the natural outcome of many sequences of problem solving and interest balancing. What must we then do? We must rescue the rational kernel from a mystical shell, the original revolutionary insight of classical social theory, and free it from the incubus of the illusions of historical fatalism. And that is the project that is necessary to inform our imagination of structural alternatives. What I desire is that legal thought become one of these disciplines of the institutional imagination and contribute to the enlightenment and the liberation of humanity. OK, I'm, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm, I'm afraid we're running out of time. I would like to well, uh, thank you, Professor Unger, for his time.